Good afternoon, and welcome to the Westchester County Association's presentation on virtual meetings and distancing meetings. My name is Bill Mooney. I'm a Senior Vice President and Group Director at Signature Bank. I'm also privileged to be a board member of the Westchester County Association and co-chair of our Real Estate and Economic Development uh, Committees and Task Force. On behalf of the Westchester County Association, our president, Michael Ramita, our entire membership and our staff, we want to welcome you to today's presentation, and we hope you and your families are all well and keeping safe. Before we move on, I want to say a special thank you to our platinum partners, without whom which programming such as this and our programming throughout the year would not be possible. On a bit of a programming note, we just wanted to let you know that the Westchester County Association is partnering with LOHUD and the Journal News to sponsor forums with respect to the Democratic candidates seeking the seat to replace Nita Lowy in a June 23rd, uh, June 23rd uh, primary. The forums will take place on June 4th at 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. can be accessed through lohud.com. Uh, Michael Ramita, our president, will be doing the introduction, and it will be hosted by LOHA journalist Mark Lungriello. So please tune in for that exciting information. I'm joined today by uh, Tony Gioffrey, a partner at Cuddy & Fader, a preeminent full-service law firm uh, serving the tri-state area based here in White Plains, as well as Ashley Lai. Ashley is a senior technician in municipal and land use planning at AKRF a professional services firm with over 350 employees in environmental scientists, planners, and economists also ser serving the tri-state area. Tony and Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Billy, for having us, and thank you to the Washington County Association. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Hopefully, we'll have a great presentation, have a little bit of fun. In the Westchester County Association's ongoing efforts to help our members through these challenging times. Uh, we are doing a number of things in real time, such as today's uh, session, but also with respect to the future. We want everyone to know the Westchester County Association has established a post-pandemic working group. This is established through a group of leaders in business, not-for-profits, real estate, law, government, and other disciplines. We'll be looking towards trying to recommend, uh, come up with recommendations to what the world's going to look like in 90 days, six months, or a year from now. So please stay in touch. Look forward to updates in that area, or you can follow us on our website or on our social media platforms for updates in the post-pandemic working group. It's very exciting. We look forward to it. As we continue to help our members through these difficult and challenging times, we're all realizing that the importance of virtual and distance meetings. Many of us have realized these are in fact doable. Some have realized those a little more reluctantly and a little more difficultly. Um, but we're also realizing they're not only doable, but they're important and they're critical and they're necessary. When things continue to open up, and they are and they will, we want our members, our Westchester business community, our Westchester community, as well as everyone to be poised to move forward. Business cannot stop. We cannot afford to be caught behind the eight ball. Virtual meetings do present their own set of challenges, particularly those seeking uh, government or municipal approvals. We're very fortunate to have Tony and Ashley here with us. They have both participated in dozens of these types of meetings. They've seen some of the ups and downs, the bumps in the road, as well as the practical applications, which they'll tell us a little bit about. Now, while Tony's practice is, is as a land use attorney and Ashley focuses in municipal and land use planning uh, and, and those disciplines in this area, we want to make it clear that the best practices we're here to talk about today should transcend just not only those disciplines in those areas. These can transcend best practices in civic meetings, community meetings, business meetings, corporate meetings, or otherwise. And not only from a legal standpoint, from a practical standpoint. So we hope you take something out of it from that respect to whatever you may choose to use it in. Now, I know we have a lot to cover, so I'll stop there and turn it over. But before I do so, I just want to let you know this presentation will be made available on the WCA's website, including the slides. So if you want to take notes, don't worry about it. They can become available. And we will allow for plenty of time for questions towards the end. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to Tony. 
Thanks, Billy. Uh, and as Billy mentioned in my introduction, I'm a land use and zoning attorney, and I've been fortunate enough where I've been able to participate in over 20 of these virtual hearings and meetings since this pandemic started. And uh, as Billy mentioned as well, uh, this presentation is going to be geared towards municipal hearings, but the principles that Ashley and I are going to discuss certainly apply to many other types of meetings that I'm all you sure are participating in uh, in this challenging time. So uh, we're going to start with uh, a little bit of background and the executive orders which have been put in place to allow us to have these virtual meetings. And I was going to start by including a a picture of Governor Cuomo on the slide so that we have an engaging PowerPoint, but I'm sure we've all seen enough of him, Trump, Fauci, and others, so we'll save the graphics for later. <laughs> uh, New York Executive Order 202.1 suspended the requirement for in-person meetings. Uh, meetings are permitted to be held remotely or by conference call, and further, the order provided that the, P the, the, the public must be afforded the ability to view or listen to the meeting. The Executive Order 202.15 extended the prior order and provided that hearings may continue remotely through the use of telephone conference, video conference, or other similar service. The order is set to expire on June 8th, and the question is whether or not it's going to be extended. Some key considerations are going to be the limitations of social distancing, building occupancy limits, and the intent of the open meetings law. For example, will the public be afforded the opportunity to participate? Or will people be afraid to go to town hall and feel that their due, price, due process rights are, are being challenged? So these are all the things that I'm confident are going to be looked at uh, in the, as these orders are being evaluated for extension. So some of the municipal concerns and barriers to setting up uh, virtual meetings at the get-go were the lack of municipal infrastructure. Um, some staff members did not have access to their email or electronic files at home. Uh, there's a lack of server-based permit tracking systems as opposed to a cloud-based tracking system, so it was harder to determine where something was in the process, especially if town hall was closed because of uh, COVID reasons and they were unable to get to their hard files. Um, the requirement for hard copies of all applications was another barrier. Um, it's been a quick transition to digital submissions for many municipalities. Also managing and receiving applications while we're working remotely or with a reduced staff, especially since some uh, hard copies and mail is being quarantined. There's also a digital divide with members of the public as well as um, even members of planning boards. I know in some communities, uh, towns have loaned laptops to planning board members so that they would be able to participate. Um, it's also important when you're selecting your uh, service to be providing these virtual meetings that you offer a service that also has a, a telephone option. And then lastly, there's a, there was a misconception that since most construction was on hold, that municipalities could hold off on processing applications. And that's something that we would like to um, address head on. Uh, it was It's very important to continue processing these applications uh, because we want to make sure that construction is able to resume more quickly. Um, next slide, please. Um, it, it, that will, in, a, in essence, allow people to get back to work sooner. Next slide, please. So one of the things that came out of the Great Recession and Superstorm Sandy was a lot of funding, a lot of stimulus funding, was tied to shovel-ready projects. So while we don't know yet, where the stimulus funding is going to end up. Um, we're still in the middle of this crisis. Uh, you know, having projects approved and shovel ready will put your community and your local businesses in a better position to be eligible for stimulus funding um, should that become available. So things have drastically changed since we've all been required to go out pause. And in-person meetings were suspended without any indication, without the ability to prepare for this new virtual environment and municipalities and project teams are learning in real time. Some of the things that Ashley and I are gonna talk about today are what we need to do. Prepare, practice, protocols, the presentation in this virtual format, notice, privacy, and closing the hearing. So in terms of processing these applications virtually, um, first off is, is accepting them digitally. And what applicants can do to make this easier on the municipality is to transmit them in a manageable way. So one email, the use of file transfer folders, um, the use of a server. If you have a large or voluminous document, uh, like a DEIS, you, you could possibly post that on your own website and provide links from the municipal website. Uh, because not every municipality has the, um, 
the server capacity to hold many files. Um, also getting up to speed on hosting virtual meetings. Take advantage of free training opportunities from service providers. Review best practices guides. Uh, there was one issued by the Westchester Municipal Planning Federation a few weeks ago. That one has a lot of great resources in it. Practice, practice, practice. Um, make sure that you know, both on the municipal side and on the applicant side, um, who's going to be leading the meeting, who's going to be calling on each person to speak when it's their turn, who's going to be presenting their screen. And then on the municipal side, also designating moderators to help run the meeting. Who's going to be controlling the screen sharing, who's going to be answering the chats and the text questions during a public hearing, and who's going to be managing the security features, such as the waiting room and muting participants to make sure that the meeting stays in order and there aren't any um, technical glitches or uh, Zoom bombers. So how do you prepare for a virtual hearing when there are no easels or poster boards or drawings and you can't have this in-person meeting? Well, some of what you will prepare is not changing. Your application, your project, your standards of the proof. So we need to decide which drawings or visual materials should be shown on the screen for presentation purposes. You need to make sure that all of your materials are available electronically and can be easily read. You should assign a specific team, team member to share your screen of visual materials for the presentation. We recommend that this not be a presenter so that you can keep a good presentation flow with your team. And you should discuss the anticipated questions and make sure each team member knows which question they should plan to address so the team members are not talking over each other. While this may be normal for any meeting, this virtual platform is new and the lack of visual cues or body language in this visual format is something that is new. So plan ahead and leave time for preparation. We recommend conducting preparation meeting with the project team using the video conferencing platform for the public hearing. And many different types of platforms can be used. Zoom, WebEx seem to be the most frequent ones, but there are many others. And we recommend having a point person who can direct questions so there's an orderly flow to the presentation. You should also walk through the presentation and have the video team members get familiar with and practice using this video conferencing technology so that you can avoid technical glitches during the hearing. This is not just for you, but for your entire team. You might have handled many of these types of virtual meetings, but this might be the first time that one of your team members is using it. The format is awkward, and you may have been handling in-person meetings for 25 years, but this new format takes a little bit of getting used to. So who's gonna share your screen for the presentation purposes? I wanna stress again the lack of visual cues and body language that you would normally have for an in-person meeting. Make sure that all of your presentation materials are available on the computer you'll be using. I had one situation where our architect was presenting and, and signed into the Zoom meeting from his wife's laptop, but all of his plans were on his work computer and were, were unavailable. It was a little bit of a snafu. We got through it and we were able to have someone share the, the plans from their own computer. So again, practicing in advance certainly helps. And we recommend having a central location for the presentation slide deck. And one thing that I would add to that from the municipal side is in, in some instances, the municipality will be the one sharing their screen and the applicant will not have the opportunity to share their screen. So it's important to organize ahead, get your files in order and transmit them in a way that the municipality can easily um, share their screen and flip through the slides in the order that you wish to speak to them. So Ashley mentioned before a little bit of the protocols from the municipality's perspective. But every municipality may be different, and sometimes even in the same municipality, different boards may have different protocols. So you should discuss these protocols with the municipality or agency in advance of the meeting to determine the format of the hearing, how will the public participation be conducted, and if the, few, if the municipality is unfamiliar with the virtual hearings, you might even be able to share some of your own experiences so that you coordinate together. Doing this will be easier for the team to anticipate how the meeting will be run and afford the team the opportunity to be more prepared in advance of the meeting. Tony, if yes, Tony, if I may, uh, on that last point, um, how are you finding the uh, back and forth between you represent the applicant in many times? How are you finding the municipality's reaction towards uh, your reaching out to assist or volunteer to set things up? I mean, it's not necessarily adversarial, but they're on different sides of the application process. Are you finding the uh, municipalities or otherwise uh, uh, receptive to that approach? 
I have to say that we're all in a strange new world. And as I mentioned before, this is a new environment and it's, it's a fluid environment and, and we're all learning in real time. Uh, with, you know, so with that as the stage, yes, I, I have been finding that virtually every municipality that we've been working in uh, has been uh, open to having this dialogue. You know, they, this is new for them. This is new for the applicants. This is new for the public uh, that is participating in these meetings. So the more that everybody can participate in advance, share their experience, Experiences so that we can have a meeting uh, run as flawlessly as possible is to everybody's benefit. The municipality, the applicant, as well as the public. And uh, I have to say that everybody that we've been working with has been receptive and open to suggestions. That's great to hear. Ashley, what's your experience in this regard? I would say that's been my experience as well. Um, you know, municipalities are offering practice sessions along with applicants in advance of meetings. They're sharing information, uh, best practices, and guidance on how to make these meetings run more smoothly. Great, great. So with regard to the presentation, obviously we must observe the procedural requirements during the hearing. And this might be the first time the board is conducting a virtual hearing. So you need to make sure that in addition to all the project specific requirements, that all new procedural requirements are also being observed. You need to confirm on the record that the meeting is being recorded and that the meeting is being transcribed in accordance with Governor Cuomo's orders. It might be also beneficial as an applicant to make sure you have your own stenographer to transcribe the virtual meeting uh, so that in case you need it in the future, it, it is available. We also recommend that you uh, ask the board to take a roll call vote rather than the board saying, all those in, fire, in favor say aye, that you make sure that you go through a roll call and make sure that all board members unmute themselves where nodding is not enough so that you have the verbal vote, yes or no, or abstain on the record. And you see the big exclamation point at the bottom of the screen, be careful what is up on your screen when you share your screen. So moving on to notice, this is the thing that makes me wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. It's the most critical public, public hearing prerequisite. We obviously need to make sure that all requisite hearing notices are met, and there may be new requ uh, requirements that are applicable, and you need to make sure that all notice requirements are met. So for example, is the local paper where you need to publish the notice of the meeting, is it still in print? Are they doing a digital format? Is that sufficient? What can you do to make sure that the public is aware that the meeting is happening, the format, and that they know how to log on or otherwise dial in. Did the virtual meeting platform invite designated end time to the meeting? I had one situation where the invite for the meeting designated that the meeting would be from five o'clock to, to seven o'clock. And at 6.59, in the middle of our traffic engineer's presentation, the chairman of the board said, well, we're at 6.59. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we're gonna adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn this matter to next month. Uh, and our team members were looking at each other on the Zoom meeting in the little boxes and said, uh, okay, <laughs> I guess we'll see you next month. So make sure you work these things out in advance. And one of the challenges that we're up against right now is because we don't know if the executive order is going to be extended and how far into June, uh, boards that are setting their public hearings right now for later in June have to figure out a way to carefully word their notices that are going in the newspaper. Uh, to make sure that the public's able to, you know, accurately find where the meeting is. Right. That's a great point. So I mentioned before the lack of visual cues and body language, and this is particularly critical when it comes to in-hearing team communications. You're not there all in the same room. This is a new normal. And many platforms have private chat rooms, but you cannot assume that these private chat rooms are that private. Will these chat rooms be subject to FOIL? What if you're in a private chat with your team members and the host shares your screen? We recommend that you set up a group text with your team so that you can communicate during meetings. The format may be a little clunky, but it's better than nothing. And what does it mean to close the public hearing? We've been seeing a lot that the best practice is that boards are keeping the written comment period open for a period after the meeting is closed. So if okay. you have a virtual meeting on a Tuesday night, We've been finding that a lot of boards have been, have been keeping the comment period open for five or 10 days afterwards. But what happens in that instance? What, the public is gonna respond, then do you have a chance to respond again? And if you do respond, what happens to the public? Does the public get a chance to respond further to your comments? So we need to make sure that the intent of the open meetings law is met, and we need to make sure that we're stating off any possibilities for litigation on one side or the other. On the municipal side, 
I'm, I'm sorry, Ashley, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, on the municipal side, one of the things we've asked is for the public hearings to be held open for 10 days for written comments. And then what we ask the applicant to do is to prepare a memorandum that goes point by point on any of the substantive comments raised by the public. And that would be submitted with the revised application in advance of the next meeting. And that information could be posted on the town's website or made available to the public uh, via, via a Freedom of Information Act request. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, um, but following up on that, one of the concerns that we've heard and people express are municipal leaders or elected officials wanting to make sure that members of the public are given uh, as much as or as important uh, opportunity to provide comment or input as they can. Uh, Ashley, are, are you finding that these open periods or or the situations or the circumstances you described are, are satisfying those municipal leaders' concerns? I would say overall, yes. Um, in some cases, and in some ways, I think that having these virtual public hearings is actually making the, the hearing more accessible to a wider demographic of people, people who um, may not have been able to get a babysitter to come out to a public hearing on an evening or had work conflicts. Uh, there are certain demographics who prefer to attend meetings in person, and that's one of the reasons why it's, it's really important that you have a phone-in option for someone who's not as comfortable using a computer. And it's also important to allow written comments, so comments that can be accepted via email or in letter form in advance or within 10 days following the meeting. So in reality, it could be even opening it even wider. Uh, Tony, do you think that this, this uh, the, the way it's structured with the open comment period, et cetera, this complies with the, the executive order, uh, encompasses this situation, and therefore uh, complies with the law satisfying public comment and participation? I, I absolutely do. Again, we can have these uh, virtual hearings. That is patently clear with the executive orders. And I think when you go to a written comment period, it's that belt and suspenders. It's that little bit extra. It's that best practices. It's that it's giving everybody the opportunity. If somebody had trouble dialing into a meeting or their wireless went down for whatever reason, it's giving the, the public an opportunity to participate in the meeting through written comment. So I, I 100%. Great, thank you. I uh, just want to uh, make a note, if any, uh, any viewers have any comments, just type them in on the, the bar below there, and we'll make sure that we get to them in the order that we receive them. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Please continue. So we're going to talk a little bit about best practices, and this format tends to be more informal than in-person meetings. So don't get caught with your pants down. I'm sure many of you have seen this Good Morning America screenshot or live situation. Uh, where the reporter who was zone cameraman was presenting from home and unfortunately he was caught with his pants down. So remember to dress in professional attire like you're attending the meeting in person. And I was looking for uh, a graphic for this slide and I was looking for a couch potato to stress the informal nature of the, of the platform and that uh, and when I, I was doing this I came across this picture that you see in the upper right where a woman actually turned herself into a couch potato and that's how she presented herself from the meeting let's make this make sure that we uh, recognize what this platform is this is just like an in-person meeting and we should respect the forum and this next picture actually happened in a community down county. Uh, a lawyer was presenting himself uh, from this posture and this position on his couch in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and a socks with a laptop on the coffee table. And the chairman of this board happened to be an old school chairman. And let's just say that uh, he was not very happy with this particular lawyer in this presentation uh, who got chastised. So again, let's make sure that we treat these, this forum with the respect it, it deserves. If it's the same chairman I'm thinking of, I would not want to be that lawyer in front of him. I think, I think you very well know who we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you're observing your best practices, avoid inter interruptions if you can. Try to conduct the meeting for, in a location-free area, free from background noise and interruptions. You know, we're all working from home right now, so... Try to, you know, we all have pets or kids or other situations and try to figure out where you can do this meeting. If you are interrupted, it's not the end of the world. I was in a, a public hearing about a week ago and we're in the middle of a two hour presentation and 
my client was sitting by for about an hour and a half, and when it came time for him to give his five uh, spiel, that's the, as Murphy's Law would have it, that was the exact time that his little daughter came running into the room. Everybody laughed. It was a moment of levity. Move on. It's, uh, we're all in this new environment, and we all have to deal with it. Do the best that you can. And I would add, for those of you with, with high school-aged children, um, be mindful of who set up your Zoom account so that when you sign in, uh, you know that your name is your name and not um, a silly name that may be a nickname of one of your kids. So uh, continuing this issue, uh, you may be wondering why I have a logo of the Grateful Dead on this screen. Um, if you, we, we were all dialing into a Zoom meeting, waiting for everybody to, uh, to become available. And while we're all saying hello and making sure everybody was okay in this pandemic, uh, one of the board members asked the village attorney, why do you have a bed sheet taped to your wall? And she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm conducting this meeting for my fiance's apartment and I didn't think anybody wanted to see his Grateful Dead posters. If you have a home office, great. That might not, not be an option for a lot of us, whether it's the kitchen, bedroom, figure out where you can do this from, weigh the pros and cons of the various locations, choose the best option, and we suggest that uh, doing it in, in, in an area where you're free from interruptions is probably your best option. So as we've said many times, we're in this new normal, and to use an Oscar Wilde quote, to expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. Uh, so in, you, you, you learn to expect the unexpected in these meetings. You don't know what's going to happen, but in this virtual format, there's probably more opportunity for that to happen. I had a public hearing a few weeks ago where a neighbor was dialing in to the Zoom meeting from her cell phone, and she, she proceeded to walk into her backyard and turn her phone around so she can show the board members what the subject property looked like from her backyard and the lights and potential impacts. So obviously you have to learn to go with it, but again, expect the unexpected. And remember that when a screen is shared, you can't see board members' reactions, so we recommend that keeping your shared screen up only when necessary. That's also helpful when you're, if you're a board member that's taking down um, the votes to be able to see everybody. It's a lot easier to, when you can see them raise their hand. Indeed. And one of the things that we've been experiencing is that you might be getting more people attending the meeting because it's much easier to dial into these meetings. Whether they finish streaming Ozark and everything else on Netflix and they're bored and this is their new entertainment, people you know, don't have to physically go to the town hall get in their car, drive down, find a parking space, walk into town hall, wait through the other hearings. They can just dial in on their phone. They can, they can do whatever, and it's much easier. So you might get a lot more people participating in meetings right now, which is not necessarily a bad thing from an open meetings perspective, but again, expect the unexpected. And lastly, and most importantly, in what to expect, what if your Wi-Fi goes down? You're in the middle of a presentation. It's not like an in-person meeting where you're being teleported out. You need to be there, so make sure that you have a backup. We recommend having your phone available so that you can dial in. Again, most of these municipalities are having multiple opportunities to participate, whether it's uh, in a Zoom format over the internet, whether it's texting your questions, whether it's written comment, whether it's emailing your questions, or just dialing in on, from a phone. And I just wanted to end on what's the next big thing. So we're up to speed on these virtual meetings now. Um, what's the next big issue that planners should be looking at to facilitate the reopening? And that is getting up to speed on your local zoning and land use regulations. What are the potential pitfalls for businesses seeking to reopen under the new guidelines? What, uh, what permitting is available for use of public streets, sidewalks, and right-of-ways as, as businesses are looking to operate outside, especially during the summer months? Can existing regulations be adapted to meet current needs? For example, your regulations on the books for farmers markets or street fairs. Does your community regulate short-term parking for things like curbside pickup? And are there restrictions on drive throughs Before we move on to any uh, closing and, and wrap-ups, I, I think we have uh, at least a few questions. Uh, if we have any, can we put them up on the screen? So if you guys can, or for the, for the audience, what will virtual hearings be acceptable post-crisis or will we return exclusively to in-person? 
Would the former require a statewide law, or could these rules be adopted by local governments absent statewide legislation? Good question. Uh, Tony, you want to take a crack first? Oh, sorry, sorry. Ashley. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I, um, so, I, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, sorry. So it, before this executive uh, um, it order was adopted, you actually could have a, a quasi virtual public hearing where it was being live streamed and some members of the public were able to participate and text in comments. So I think that that would likely be able to, that would certainly would be able to continue going forward. Uh, I think there's going to be a transition period where we're going to have to allow, um, you know, some social distancing in the audience and some continued participation from home, uh, even including some board members. I, I totally agree. I, I think there's definitely going to be a potential hybrid approach, at least for the foreseeable future. You know, we've talked a lot about the open meetings law, social distancing requirements, and building occupancy limits. If a board has, a, for example, a, you know, 10 items on the agenda, and there's a lot of public participation, and you can only have 50 people in the room for building occupancy limits, how can everybody be in that room at one time? You know, are people going to have to wait in their cars and be shepherded into the meeting? Uh, or you know, what if people are afraid to go into the, to the meeting and they're afraid to expose themselves if they're at high risk? So I, I think for the short term, it's probably going to be better practice that uh, we do still have this virtual format available so that people can participate, whether they're afraid to, whether they can't access the meeting, whether they can't get to the meeting, and for a number of other reasons. So it sounds like you both feel that there is an opportunity that I think we all probably recognize that it's a reality. There's the hybrid will occur in that approach. And it also sounds like from what you both stated that it, it's currently allowable. Um, despite that, Tony, do you, or Ashley, uh, but Tony, do you feel that the executive order will be extended at this time? If things are changing daily and phase two, right. for example, is supposed to open up and you know, on the eve of phase two, things started to change. So I think it's anybody's guess. I would think that the order is going to have to be extended in order to allow business to uh, happen and allow these meetings to continue. If not, then you're basically mandating that these types of meetings uh, have to be shut down and any types of these meetings. And, and look, as we get to phase two of this reopening, there's going to be a number of opportunities uh, for these matters to go forward. And you have to have boards meeting to allow beyond just a developer's application, but many of the functions the municipality needs to do for just government uh, operations to continue. It sounds like the old adage of uh, from your presentation of uh, preparation prevents poor performance is, is more important than ever. Um, and, and following up on, on at the risk of trying to ask you to have a crystal ball, uh, do both of you have thoughts on on going forward what what we could look for or, or look forward to or or not some of the troublesome issues or some of the positive issues in terms of virtual meetings I, I think it's critical that they continue to be allowed um, it's something that's relatively easy for a municipality to undertake it's something that allows businesses to continue business to continue for projects to continue to be approved um, I think the hybrid approach can be a little bit more challenging. As difficult as it is to read body language when we're all on a screen, I think it's even harder to do so when some people are in the room and then others are on the screen. So in some ways that's a little bit more challenging. Uh, so I think this, this is a, a good approach to continue doing what we're doing. It's keeping people safe and it's keeping things moving. Uh, I agree, and I would just add to that, uh, I think the one thing that, you know, to look into the crystal ball, the, I think one of the things that we are going to see is some potential litigation. Um, you know, with, what do these orders mean? Uh, how are people participating? Oh, what is this new environment like? What's happening with the statute of limitations? Uh, so uh, I would anticipate that at least we're going to see some new legislation and new areas as, as a result of everything that we're going through. When I was director of economic development for the county and business leaders would ask me, are there truly opportunities here in Westchester? We had a former planning commissioner, which I know you guys know and probably many of our viewers know and are very fond of, who used to answer, yes, opportunity does exist for the willing, for the willing. And well, it's very encouraging to hear uh, from you guys that there's so many willing participants on both sides 
of the process here. Municipalities recognize business needs to keep moving to help the tax base, to help their residents, to help their business owners, etc. And the applicants also recognize that they need to partner with the municipalities to continue to move these forward. So I'm very encouraged to hear uh, what you both had to say in that regard. Uh, if there are no further questions, if you guys have any closing comments, we could... Oh, I'm sorry, we do have another question. And... I'm a commercial real estate broker who represents a quick service restaurant franchise. drive through windows represent a big part of their income. What advice do you have for p pitching municipal planners that in this day and age, drive through services window are valuable? Uh, my screen is blocked. Uh, with respect to local code banning them needs to be reformed. Ashley? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, I would say that this is a very hot topic right now. This is definitely on the list of things and codes that are being looked at by planners in, in many municipalities. Uh, there are bans on drive throughs within certain distances. There are bans on drive throughs in certain downtown areas. Um, you know, in most traditional planning and the whole idea of a walkable neighborhood, um, you don't want drive throughs. You want people to get out of their cars right. and socialize. But right now we're finding drive throughs to be incredibly helpful. So I think that is something that is going to be looked at in the, sh in the short term. That and um, designated parking spaces for curbside pickup is also relevant and also temporary outdoor seating areas. It's going to be a hot topic. Yes, I, I would agree with that as well. I, historically, and what we've been experiencing, particularly in large mixed-use developments, uh, there's been a hesitancy for municipalities to have drive-throughs or to encourage drive-throughs or permit them. Uh, I had just last week for the first time for a project that's been under review for a period of time where a board member specifically asked this question, uh, what, what are you doing to accommodate uh, this pandemic type of response in terms of drive-throughs, ease of pickup for people that are afraid to go in? Uh, so these are things that are being evaluated and whether they're implemented into code amendments or they're implemented into projects in other ways, I think you know, we're going to see a, a change in, in, in the shift of the way municipalities are looking at this, as well as developers incorporating these types of elements into their projects. That's great. Um, I don't think we have any further questions before I wrap up. Would you guys like to make any uh, final statements? We've covered a lot, but if, Tony, if you'd like to uh, finish up, and then we'll go to Ashley. Uh, I think, Billy, the way you summed it up before is that there's opportunity for the willing is, is, is probably the best statement that was made uh, in this entire presentation. Uh, there are some municipalities that have not conducted any of these types of meetings yet, so we certainly encourage people to and uh, municipalities to reach out, to learn more. There are a lot of resources that are available. There are a lot of people that have experience with this, so to the extent you could, you could do that so that business could continue would be fantastic. And I would just like to thank you, uh, Ashley, Mike Ramita, and the Westchester County Association for putting on this forum and allowing me to participate. It was a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Ashley? Yes, so thank you for inviting me to participate as well. Um, I would just say that, yes, continuing these municipal meetings online, continuing to do what you can as a municipality and as, a, and as an applicant to move forward with your applications, to process applications, um, to look at your code, to take a look at your comprehensive plan and your zoning to see if there's anything that you can do coming forward uh, to prepare for, for what life is going to be like post-COVID. Thank you. Uh, both of you mentioned there are many resources available. I want to tell our viewers we have two wonderful resources right here in Cuddy and Fader and Tony Joffrey and Ashley Lai from AKRF, uh, including the Westchester County Association as a resource. As I mentioned, uh, this presentation will be made available on the website, including the slides. But we really want to thank Tony and Ashley for your expertise. You're dedicating your time uh, towards us, the county association, and the entire Westchester community for providing this. Uh, again, a little programming note. Don't forget the county association is co-sponsoring uh, with Low HUD and the Journal News, uh, Democratic Candidates Forum for the Democratic primary to replace Nita Lowy in Congress. Uh, that primary is on the 23rd. The forums will take place on June 4th at 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., hosted by our own Michael Ramita. Uh, we once again want to thank our platinum partners who have helped make this programming as well as our programming throughout the year uh, possible. There they are. 
And once again, on behalf of our president, Michael Ramita, and all of us at the County Association, we appreciate everybody's time. We thank Tony and Ashley once again. Um, thank you all for who's watching and, and who are participating in helping us move Westchester forward. Please, everyone, stay safe and stay well, and the best to you and your families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.